The Enterobacteriaceae are a big family of organisms, so let's talk about the specifics of each genus and in some cases the species. So this is Unit 8 for Micro 1 where we're going to talk about more specifics when it comes to the enterics. So the first group I want to discuss is Escherichia, and there's actually seven species. Um, by far the most commonly isolated enteric in the clinical lab is E. coli. And E. coli is part of our normal gut flora. Um, there are some strains that can be sorbitol negative, and those strains could be 0157H7. Now the reason we care about 0157H7 E. coli is because it can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome, and we'll talk more about that in the future. MVIC is a acronym that stands for Indol, Methyl Red, Vogis, Proskauer, and Citrate. MVIC tests used to be used for environmental organisms, um, but we like to use it when we're describing the Indol, Methyl Red, Vogis, Proskauer, and Citrate. And you can see there that it's positive for Indol, positive for Methyl Red, negative for Vogis, Proskauer, and negative for Citrate. And that would be all of the organisms in the Escherichia group. They are lysine decarboxylase positive, and you can see what looks like a green metallic sheen on EMB due to the vigorous lactose fermentation. So if you take a look at that image on the right, this is EMB. EMB only has lactose in it, and if you have a vigorous lactose fermenter, it will be metallic green. And most commonly that happens with E. coli. If you compare, compare your EMB plate to your TSI slant, you can see the TSI slant is acid over acid, which basically is yellow over yellow. So lactose and sucrose have been fermented and also glucose. Remember, all of our enterics are glucose fermenters. There are 100 and different 170 different serological types for Escherichia, and they are biochemically closely related to Shigella. In fact, they're genetically similar in their DNA, and they are in the same tribe. They have a broad pathology. Most of the time, Escherichia can be normal gut flora, unless, of course, they're a toxin strain, like a Shiga toxin producing strain. A Shiga toxin is a toxin that is Shigella like in nature, um, but it's actually produced by Escherichia. Escherichia can cause dysentery-like di diarrheal disease as well, especially from our 0157H7 strain or other toxigenic strains. It is the number one cause of urinary tract infections in women, and it also can lead to other opportunistic diseases like endocarditis. E. coli might also be an extended spectrum beta-lactamase producer, and if you remember from previous lectures, beta-lactamase positive organisms are ones that are positive, I'm sorry, resistant to penicillin, ampicillin, and our first generation cephalosporins, but an ESBL like E. coli, or maybe in some cases even Klebsiella, the ESBLs are resistant to penicillin and are third and fourth generation cephalosporins. So just to kind of recap the ESBL discussion, an ESBL is an extended spectrum beta-lactamase producer, and certain organisms like Klebsiella and pneumoniae and E. coli are especially resistant to penicillin and are third and fourth generation cephalosporins and also the carbapenem antibiotics. The ESBLs break down these types of drugs to form water and salts, and these water and salts produce acids and bases, making them very resistant to beta-lactam drugs. And of course, those beta-lactam drugs are, are penicillins, ampicillins, and cephalosporins. There are actually four categories of toxin-producing E. coli, but I just want to talk about the two most common, okay? I want to talk about the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which are known as the EHEX, and the enterotoxigenic E. coli, which are called the ETEX. These are toxic strains of E. coli that have been known to occur in hospitals, daycare centers, nurseries, and contaminated food. In fact, there was a nationwide outbreak of E. heck on romaine lettuce that happened in January of 2017. But the E. heck strains of E. coli are associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, and this would include the strain 0157H7, which produces shiga toxins. 0157H7 causes about 75,000 infections or documented infections a year and about 60 deaths annually, okay? Um, and it may cause hemorrhagic colitis. 
Now, the e-texts, on the other hand, are associated with traveler's diarrhea, basically where a person has large volumes of diarrhea. There's no blood or pus in the diarrhea, but the disease is similar to cholera in terms of volumes of stool that a person produces. People that have e-tech will have a low-grade fever, nausea, and, and abdominal cramps, but it usually is a mild self-limiting type of disease. Miscellaneous toxins are produced with the ETEC strain. Adults and children may both be affected by this, and typically it's not invasive. So in other words, it doesn't usually destroy the gastrointestinal mucosa. Probably the most clinically significant E. coli strain is 0157H7. This is an enterohemorrhagic strain. It's a strain of E. coli that produces shiga toxins that cause human illness. The 0157H7 strain will not ferment sorbitol, so it is colorless on MAC with sorbitol. Okay? Once we have isolated a, a sorbitol negative E. Escherichia coli, then we have to serotype it with the 0157 and H7 antisera to see if we have an 0157 H7 strain. This is an agglutination test with specific antisera for this strain of E. coli. A little bit more about E. coli 0157H7. They do produce toxins like virotoxin 1 and 2 and enterohemolysin. They are lactose positive and sorbitol negative. The media of choice for isolation is max sorbitol, where our organisms are going to be colorless because they're sorbitol negative. When people have E. coli 0157H7, they often have a low-grade fever. There are no white cells seen in the stool, but occasionally you can see a red cell in the stool, and this leads to hemolytic anemia, or low platelet counts and kidney failure and low red cell counts. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is when we have toxins from E. coli that go into the bloodstream and actually destroy the red cells. Kidneys fail trying to filter out shards of broken RBCs. Okay? It's been estimated that this strain can be found in 1 to 2.5% of beef samples, because that's usually we, where we get E. coli 0157H7, and this is the one that is associated with eating raw or undercooked hamburger. There is a human vaccine that is in progress for this disease, um, and there is already a vaccine for cattle that, that exists already. Citrobacter is the next organism that I'd like to discuss, and there are 11 species of Citrobacter. Now, one thing that we need to know about Citrobacter is that it can be confused with Salmonella. 80% of Citrobacters are hydrogen sulfide positive, and Salmonella is sulf hydrogen sulfide positive. Okay? Um, Citrobacter is a lactose fermenter. So the TSI is going to be acid over acid plus H2S because it does produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, the lysine decarboxylase test is, is negative, and in Salmonella, it's going to be positive. So your LIA for Citrobacter frondii is going to be purple over yellow plus H2S. It, for Salmonella, your LIA would be purple over purple plus H2S. Remember, we look at our lysine decarboxylase in the butt of the tube. So in Citrobacter, the base of the tube is going to be yellow, which indicates a negative decarboxylase test. A positive decarboxylase test, like you would see in Salmonella, the butt of the LIA tube is actually purple. Okay, the urea for Citrobacter could be positive, um, but is generally negative. Other things that differentiate Citrobacter from Salmonella is potassium cyanide. Citrobacter will grow in the presence of potassium cyanide, while Salmonella will not. And Citrobacter frondii is also OMPG positive, while Salmonella is not. So I would probably make a note of that. Citrobacter can be found throughout the environment, like in places of soil, water, and wastewater, but it's also normal flora in the gastrointestinal tract of humans. It may be the cause of UTI, so it is an opportunistic organism. It can actually lead to meningitis, and usually this is neonatal meningitis, and it can also lead to nosocomial infections as well. 
There are a couple species I want to talk about. Citrobacter frondii we're going to work with in lab, so you're responsible to know the metabolics of that organism. Citrobella coceri, we don't, Citrobacter coceri, we're not talking about that one too much in lab, but I wanted to show you how they are different, these species. So you can see that Citrobacter frondii is H2S positive and coceri is H2S negative. Our ornithine decarboxylates for Citrobacter is negative and it's positive for Citrobacter coceri. You can see that our indole is variable and positive. And you can just kind of see in that chart there how we can compare the difference, okay? Um, keep in mind that little blurb at the bottom just says that Citrobacter is negative um, for LDC and Salmonella is positive for LDC. There are 15 species of Enterobacter and they resemble Klebsiella macroscopically. Both Klebsiella and Enterobacter are very mucoid pink colonies on Mac. Motility-wise, Enterobacter is positive for motility while Klebsiella is negative, okay? Um, most are lactose fermenters, so your TSI is going to be acid over acid, and they are vigorous gas producers. Klebsiella is probably the most vigorous gas producer, but Enterobacter can form gas as well. The Invec tests are just the opposite as Escherichia. You can see that the Indol and Methyl Red are negative, the Vogue's Proskauer and the Citrate are positive. Okay, some common species would be Klebsiella erogenes, which used to be Enterobacter erogenes. We also have Enterobacter cloacae, and then, and then we have Pantoea agglomerans and Chronobacter sakazaki. Those are the old names, uh, or these are the new names for the old genus of, of Enterobacter. So like I said, our Enterobacters are normally found as gastrointestinal flora, and they are totally normal for the most part. They are found readily in the environment, including found in the soil, water, and sewage. They may be the cause of UTI, septicemia, wound abscesses, nosocomial infections, and especially neonatal meningitis, which is associated with Enterobacter sakazaki. Enterobacter is ornithine decarboxylase positive, while your Klebsiella's are ornithine decarboxylase negative. The only um, outlier for that is Klebsiella erogenes, which is ornithine decarboxylase positive, but the rest of your Klebsiella's are negative. I want to talk about Chronobacter sakazaki because it used to be classified as an Enterobacter. This is an organism that has been found in powdered infant formula and powdered milk. There was actually um, 12 cases of this that occurred in the United States in 2011. It is rarely encountered but often has a fatal outcome in infants with septicemia and meningitis. This is a yellow pigmented Enterobacter cloacae. So in other words, um, if you have a yellow pigmented Enterobacter cloacae, it's got to be a Chronobacter sakazaki. Reports have linked, been linked to this organism in contaminated infant formula and powdered milk. We don't want to confuse this organism with P. agglomerans that is also intensely yellow. And Coronobacterium sakazaki is lysine decarboxylase negative, ornithine decarboxylase positive, and arginine decarboxylase positive. While Enterobacter orogenes, which is now Klebsiella orogenes, is just the opposite with a positive LDC, a negative ODC, and a negative ADC. That's arginine. Let's talk about Hafnia alvei. Oh, Hafnia, you're such a troublemaker. Hafnia can be difficult to identify because metabolically it is so variable, but there's one species and two biotypes, and it is tough to differentiate from an organism known as serratia. This was formerly known as Enterobacter hafnia, and it does not ferment lactose or sucrose, so your TSI is going to be alkaline over acid. Like I said, it is similar to serratia, but it does not produce lipase, otherwise they are pretty similar biochemically. Okay, And like I said, most of the time hafnia is normal gut flora, but there are some studies that are saying that they can cause gastroenteritis. Now keep in mind, serratia is usually citrate positive, gelatinase positive, and lipase negative, but our hafnias are citrate negative, gelatinase negative, and lipase negative. Because hafnia does not 
ferment lactose or sucrose. It is going to be alkaline over acid gas. It does produce small amounts of gas. It is lysine and ornithine decarboxylase positive and indole negative. Your MRVP can be variable with this organism, which makes it interesting because most of the time if your MR is positive, your VP is going to be negative and vice versa. But in the case of Hafnia alvei, sometimes you can have a positive MR and a positive VP, or they can both be negative. This is classified as a slow lactose fermenter. It does ferment lactose beyond 24 hours, but at 18 to hours or less, it is going to be a slow lactose fermenter. It is usually ONPG positive, and again, that's the test for low, slow lactose fermentation. This is actually a good candidate for the ONPG test um, because it's tough to initially tell if it ferments lactose. There are eight species of Klebsiella, and it's pretty recognizable. It's usually very mucoid because it has a capsule. And you can see Klebsiella over on the right. The upper uh, image is blood auger plate. You can see it's gray and mucoid. And then you can see it is a lactose fermenter. So it's pink on MAC and also very mucoid. Again, there are eight species, and they are lactose fermenters, um, and they are uh, very vigorous gas producers. They're very prominent gas producers and very rapid lactose fermenters. They're non-modal. That's a test you can do with the, to really rule out most of your enterics, okay? Klebsiella is non-modal. Klebsiella pneumoniae is usually lysine decarboxylase negative, and it's always indole negative. Klebocytoka is LDC positive and always indole positive. Kleb orogenes used to be an enterobacter. Okay, so your Klebsiella pneumoniae, your invic is negative, negative, positive, positive, which is the opposite of E. coli. Klebsiella oxytoka, your invic is positive, negative, positive, positive. So you can see that your indol is positive for Kleb oxytoka, but your indol is negative for Kleb pneumoniae. Klebsiella is considered to be normal flora of the gastrointestinal tract, and it may be a pathogen outside of the GI tract. Kleb pneumo and Kleb oxytoka can cause things like pneumonia, septicemia, urinary tract infections, and wound infections. Okay, Klebsiella pneumoniae is the most common Klebsiella isolated in cases of pneumonia. Klebsiella oxytoca is usually isolated in cases of pneumonia, septicemia, urinary tract infections, and wound infections. Now keep in mind, Klebsiella, along with your E. coli, can be an ESBL as well. So here's some metabolics that we can compare between Klebsiella and Enterobacter. So all of your Klebsiellas are ornithine decarbox negative and motility negative, except for Klebsiella orogenes, which is ODC positive and motility positive. Your enterobacters, on the other hand, are ODC positive and motility pos positive. Serratia is kind of a funny little organism. To me, it reminds me of a hafnia because they are closely related and they are metabolically similar to one another. This bug can be difficult to identify um, manually. There are 10 species of serratia. Unlike other enterics, they produce lipase and gelatinase and hydrolytic enzymes. They are slow lactose fermenters. Okay, Your KIA, which only has lactose and glucose in it, will be alkaline over acid in the first 24 hours, but they are sucrose fermenters, so your TSI is going to be acid over acid, indicating sucrose fermentation. This bug is a good candidate for OMPG testing because it should be positive. It's lacking beta-galactoside permease, and it is a slow lactose fermenter. Serratia is usually citrate positive, and hafnia is generally citrate negative. The most common species of serratia is serratia marcescens. It is associated with different human infections, including pneumonia and septicemia. There's another type of serratia called serratia liquefaciens, proteomaculans, gramisi, and this is a complex that is usually only associated with plant diseases and not human diseases. Okay, Serratia marcescens, um, this is a, an interesting organism. It's especially problematic, problematic for people that are immunocompromised people, but it can also be quite antibiotic resistant. 
Now here's one thing that's pretty fun about serratia marcescens. I would say a good 90% of the time this organism is gray, but there is a mutation that occurs in some strains of serratia marcescens where it has a brick red pigment, as you can see here in this um, pretty picture. There are five species of Proteus, and Proteus is named after Proteus, the god of the sea, and its ability to change shape. Proteus can actually swarm on your plate, and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. Most species are not lactose fermenters, but Proteus vulgaris occasionally is a sucrose fermenter. So our TSIs are usually alkaline over acid, but you may see acid over acid if you have a sucrose fermenter. They're both H2S positive, but your TSI may not demonstrate this. Instead, you may note it in your SIM or your LIA as it requires a high amount of ferrous sulfate in the media for this to be observed. It's very modal and it will actually swarm your plate, and I'm going to show you a picture of that. It's lysine decarboxylase negative, urea positive. It, in fact, it's a very rapid um, urease producer and breaks down urea very quickly. It's also phenylalanine deaminase positive. We can compare Proteus vulgaris to Proteus mirabilis because their lysine deaminase um, for Proteus vulgaris is negative. Lysine deaminase is positive for Proteus mirabilis. Remember, if you take a look at your LIA tube, it's going to be wine over yellow. And remember, lysine deaminase occurs in the slant of the tube, and that's where we're looking for that wine color. Proteus vulgaris and mirabilis can be differentiated by indole as well. Proteus vulgaris is indole positive and Proteus mirabilis is indole negative. And then you can see your ornithine decarboxylase um, is also variable as well. Ornithine decarboxylase is negative for Proteus vulgaris and positive for Proteus mirabilis. Proteus can be normal flora of the gut and these numbers may actually increase in patients that are taking oral antibiotics. It may cause UTIs. In fact, Proteus is the number two cause of UTIs. It is resistant to your furidantin, which is normally the drug of choice for your UTIs. As you can see in the image here, this organism actually swarms over your plate. Swarming is not demonstrated on all media types, but it is definitely demonstrated on some, especially blood agar. The reason that our organism swarms is because of its logarithmic growth patterns and its paratrichous flagella arrangement. You can see in the bottom right image how we've placed the organism at the very top and it's actually swarmed the plate in waves. Now, like I said, when it comes to Proteus, you may not see the H2S production in your TSIs or even your LIAs, but you should be able to see them in your SIMs and maybe on your plates as well. The spot indole test is a good way to differentiate Proteus vulgaris from Proteus mirabilis. Proteus vulgaris, the indole is positive, and the in Proteus mirabilis, the indole is negative. Okay? Proteus mirabilis is usually the species associated with human infections, and swarming can be best demonstrated on your non-inhibitory enriched plates like blood agar or chocolate agar. I just want to talk a little bit about the spot indole test. The spot indole test is very much like oxidase, where we take our indole reagent and we put it on a piece of filter paper, and then we smash our bug into the filter paper. If the, the area where we smash the bug turns bright aqua blue, that is positive for the spot indole test. And we'll be doing the spot indole test on E. coli and some other organisms like Pasteurella. There's one species of Morganella called Morganella morganae. There are two subspecies associated with this organism as well. It is similar to the Proteus genus, and it's actually in the same tribe along with Providencia. They are non-lactose, non-sucrose fermenters, and so the TSI is going to be alkaline over acid gas. Morganella, even though it's in the same tribe as Proteus, does not swarm. It is urea positive, phenylalanine deaminase positive, indole positive, and lysine deaminase and lysine decarboxylase negative. So your LIA is going to be purple over yellow, negative for lysine deaminase and negative for lysine decarboxylase. Morganella is usually isolated as normal gastro intestinal flora. However, it can be an opportunistic pathogen. It's most commonly isolated from post-operative wound infections. Okay? Um, 
it is associated with urinary tract infections and citrate is going to be negative, which differentiates it from Providencia, which is citrate positive. Our H2S is normally negative, but it can be variable and it differentiates this organism from Proteus. It is ornithine decarboxylase positive. So if you wanted to compare Morganella to Providencia, Morganella is citrate negative, Providencia is citrate positive. Morganella is ornithine decarboxylase positive, while Providencia is ornithine decarboxylase negative. It's important to compare the two because they're both in the same tribe. There's five species of Providencia and they are in the same tribe as Proteus and Morganella. They are lactose and sucrose negative, therefore your TSI will be alkaline over acid. They are phenylalanine deaminase positive and Providencia stewardi is, the mo is almost always negative for urea, but Providencia rutgeri is consistently positive for urea. Unlike Proteus, the H2S is going to be negative. The organisms that are H2S positive are Salmonella, Citrobacter, and Proteus. Providencia is normal flora of the gut and it once in a while causes a urinary tract infection or miscellaneous infection. It can be an opportunistic organism. Here what I've done is I've tried to compare Morganella morganae, Providencia stewardi, and Proteus when it comes to urea, H2S, citrate, and ornithine decarboxylase. So take a moment to look at that. There are 1.4 million human cases of salmonella worldwide every year and 40,000 cases of salmonella in the USA. Usually that results in about 600 deaths per year. The largest U.S. outbreak of salmonella occurred in 1985 when there was 200,000 people ill from bad milk. Salmonella has a very complex taxonomy. There's actually 2,400 known serotypes. There are two species, Salmonella enterica and Salmonella bongeri, and six subspecies of Salmonella enterica. We've got enterica enterica, enterica salme, enterica arizonae, enterica diarizonae, enterica houtonae, and enterica indica. It's usually Salmonella serotype type from Merium that is the serotype of the genus that indicates its serological activity to the ONH antigens. This is actually the strain of Salmonella that causes typhoid fever. Salmonella typhi is the serotype name of all subspecies in the group Salmonella enterica. So like I said, it has a very complex taxonomy. Salmonella is not normal flora, okay? It actually causes salmonellaosis and is communicable and reportable. This is an organism that has to be called to the state health department, the doctor or nurse in charge of the patient, and also the epidemiology nurse at the hospital, okay? Um, it is a non-lactose and non-sucrose fermenter, and so your TSI is gonna be alkaline over acid plus H2S. It is lysine decarboxylase positive, which differentiates from Citrobacter. The reason we care about that is Citrobacter is H2S positive as well, but Salmonella is LDC positive, while Citrobacter is LDC negative. The urea is going to be negative, which differentiates from Proteus. Remember, Proteus is H2S positive, but Salmonella is urea negative, and Proteus is urea positive. Salmonella is modal, that differentiates it from Shigella because Shigella is non-modal. We can actually use a McConkie or EMB or some mildly selective media and then a moderately selective media like HE, XLD, or SS for isolation. We also want to add a gram negative broth and a selenite broth to that stool culture in clinical specimens. Salmonella is always a pathogen in any body site. Usually we isolate it from stools, but it has been isolated in urine cultures and also blood cultures of carriers. Infections are caused from fecally contaminated food or water and direct contact with reptilian pets that carry the organism. Lizards, snakes, and turtles all carry salmonella. There are four types of conditions associated with salmonella. Basic gastroenteritis, bacteremia, 
septicemia, and typhoid fever. And then there are people that who just carry the organism and shed the organism. The most common is gastroenteritis, and that causes vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and fever. Other sources of salmonella infection can be pets and other animal reservoirs. Um, animals like mice, cattle, and chickens all carry salmonella. Animal products such as poultry eggs, plant food that has blood or bone meal in it, that can be a source of salmonella. If you have water that has been fecally contaminated and you ingest it um, through the fecal oral route, you can get salmonella from that reason. Some medical products like vitamin additives have been associated with salmonella. And some commercially sold foodstuffs like eggnog, candy bars, cream pies, uh, dry milk and frozen dinners. Now salmonella can be destroyed by cooking your food at greater than 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 66 degrees Celsius. Or if you refrigerate your food at less than 40 degrees or less than five degrees Celsius, you can destroy salmonella um, toxins as well. Okay, uh, I always say if you take microbiology, you're never going to want to uh, eat anything, go anywhere, or have any friends because you're going to find out all of these infectious diseases um, that are floating around in the world. Some virulence factors that make salmonella especially virulent and pathogenic would be its ability to adhere through fimbrae. The fimbrae that salmonella has holds onto the mucosal and artificial surfaces um, of the human body or something like um, cutting boards. Invasiveness, um, salmonella can invade the gastrointestinal lining of its human host. And then also salmonella produces enterotoxins. Okay, there is a vaccine that's been explored, but has not gone too far in development at this point. So there are four clinical conditions associated with salmonella, but I'm only going to talk about the most common. Condition one is called gastroenteritis. This is basically food poisoning. As few as 1 million organisms can actually cause this, and it can be very life-threatening in elderly people or people that are immunosuppressed. It is associated with contaminated cooking utensils or improper food preparation. Usually it has an eight to 36 hour incubation period. So if you eat something and you don't get sick right away, you're likely to have salmonella. Things like staph and bacillus, they usually make you sick very, very quickly if you have food poisoning from them. Symptoms of salmonella would be nausea, vomiting, fever, chills, diarrhea, and it is considered self-limiting. What I mean by that is, is that it is usually not treated with antibiotics. Usually they only give our patients fluid replacement therapy. Um, however, if you're a child and you have gastroenteritis from salmonella, they might give you ampicillin. But most of the time in adults, it is self-limiting. So basically, your own immune system takes care of it. And even though you feel cruddy for a few days, eventually you'll get better because of your strong immune system. The second condition, condition associated with salmonella is typhoid or paratyphoid fever. This is also known as enteric fever. It's only found in humans, it's not found in animals, this disease, and it's transmitted via the fecal oral route. So if you eat um, contaminated, fecally contaminated food, or you drink fecally contaminated water, this is how a person gets typhoid or paratyphoid fever. It has a very long incubation period of about 9 to 14 days, and the, and the symptoms associated with typhoid and paratyphoid fever are fever, bacteremia, um, inflamed lymph nodes, spleen impairment and involvement, and sometimes serious constipation happens before diarrhea. The best way to identify salmonella is first by looking at the macroscopic characteristics, okay? Um, especially what does it look like on our mildly me selective medias and our moderately selective medias. On blood auger, they're often large, gray, flat, gamma hemolytic. On other medias, they're lactose negative and H2S positive. On the TSI, they're alkaline over acid plus H2S. Okay, the biochemical and metabolic testing for salmonella would, would show that they are urea negative and lysine decarboxylase positive. We can confirm cases of salmonella by serotyping the strain that we have isolated. We're going to type cellular and flagellar antigens with antisera to determine what serotype our salmonella is. That's really important from an epidemiological standpoint. 
Shigella is another organism that is pretty serious. This, if you ever isolate a Shigella, this has to be called to the patient's um, caretaker as well. Okay, there are four species of Shigella and 43 serotypes. Shigella is very closely related to Escherichia and they're actually in the same tribe. Like I said, it is communicable and reportable, so we do want to report it to the patient's nurse or doctor. We want to report it to the state health department, and then we also want to report it to the hospital epidemiologist. Shigellas are non-lactose and non-sucrose. Um, I'm sorry, non-lactose are slow lactose fermenters, and they are not sucrose fermenters either. They don't produce gas, and they don't produce H2S. They're all lysine decarboxylase negative. That differentiates it from salmonella, which are lysine decarboxylase po positive. They're all metabolically alike except for Shigella sonii, which is ornithine decarbox positive and OMPG positive. All of your other three species of Shigella are ODC and OMPG negative. Okay? You can use the McConkie and EMB as your mildly selective auger to isolate and identify Shigella, and then you're going to want to pair that up with a moderately selective um, media as well. So you could use XLD, HE, or SS. But these organisms are going to be lactose sucrose negative within the first 24 hours. They're H2S negative, and biochemically they're pretty inert. Just keep in mind, all of the Shigellas are very similar except for Shigella sonii, which is positive for OMPG um, and positive for ornithine decarboxylase. Because Shigella can be serotyped, we actually have serotype names along with scientific names, and so you will need to know those, okay? Shigella dysenteriae causes the most serious disease. It's not commonly isolated in this country, but that is called Group A Shigella. Shigella flexneri is known as Group B Shigella. Shigella boidii is known as Group C Shigella. And then the most common Shigella strain isolated in the U.S. is Shigella sonii, which is also known as Group D Shigella. Okay? As you can see on the chart there, they are all metabolically similar to one another, except for Shigella sonii, which is positive for OMPG and positive for ornithine decarboxylase. So Shigella is always a pathogen whenever it's isolated. It causes severe dysentery that results in intestinal mucosal epithelial cell destruction. Okay, It is the most communicable of all the bacterial diseases, and it really doesn't take hardly any organisms to make a person sick. Okay, It is communicable via the fecal-oral route, and flies can actually transmit this as well. So flies can land on fecal debris. They can take that fecal debris and land on your food, and then if you eat it, there you go. You have Shigella. Symptoms of Shigella would be a dys dysentery-like diarrhea. Uh, this could actually be fatal. Fever, acute painful gastroenteritis and colitis and bloody diarrhea. Um, some patients can be asymptomatic, but that is rare. Um, usually people that are on Shigella are treated with antibiotics. They are treated with antibiotics, okay? The best way to prevent Shigella and Salmonella is through hand washing. Hand washing can greatly reduce the spread of Salmonella and Shigella. Now, you might be wondering about norovirus and campylobacter. I, I haven't talked about this too much, but norovirus is the most common cause of viral stomach issues. It's super highly communicable. And then campylobacter is the most common bacterial cause of gastrointestinal issues. All right, so that's it. That is it for our Unit 12 lecture on enterics. I would definitely um, take some time to um, write these metabolic tests out and look up that chart in your book because you will need to know um, how to identify these organisms and differentiate them from one another. This is a big part of your board of certification test, identifying these enterics. All right, have a great day.